Thank you all for coming. It's uh, my, I'm Lisa Hajar, visiting professor in um, Kassar this year. And on behalf of the Assam Faris Institute and Kames, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, John Chalcroft, who's a reader in history and politics of empire and imperialism at the London School of Economics. John's work uh, focuses on history from below in the Middle East. He's the author of The Striking Cabbies of Cairo and Other Stories, Crafts and Guilds in Egypt, 1863 to 1914, and uh, The Invisible Cage, Syrian Migrant Workers in Lebanon. And today he's going to be talking about uh, his new work, which has to do, or well, his ongoing work on um, uh, transition, transnational popular politics and protest movements and the making and unmaking of um, the Arab world. So thank you, John. Thank you very much. Well, it's a, it's a very uh, pleasure, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you very much to Kames and the Isem Faris Center for inviting me. Uh, does, is this microphone working uh, at the back and so on? Okay, great. So this paper is called um, Contestation and the Border Crossing Political Imagination, the Arab Uprisings and Beyond. Many have spoken of the spread of protest across borders during the Arab Uprisings. But surprisingly little attention has been paid to the ways in which border crossing and transnationalism has played a productive role in contestation and contentious politics in the Middle East and North Africa. I'm speaking about the history and the social sciences in general. This talk interrogates that question. And I draw on examples going back to the 18th century and the fruits of a five-year research project that I'm in the middle of and I'm trying to write the manuscript for <coughs> as we speak. The idea is against the conventional wisdom, but of course building on existing work, I aim to explore the hitherto rather occluded significance of the border crossing political imagination in the making of contentious politics in the region. And I aim not to lapse into culturalism or to deny the importance of local context along the way. But the challenge, uh, the premise by which I departed on the, this research project comes it's a challenge that's laid down by Jeff Ely in his book, A uh, Crooked Line, where he says, uh, and he, he sort of sets out to review all of known historiography of the last 40 years. And this is the very last paragraph of that book. And he says, uh, if optimism, disappointment, and reflectiveness were the main registers of the radical historian's sensibility between the 60s and the 90s, perhaps defiance is the appropriate response for our new contemporary moment. For more than a decade now, we've been encouraged to see ourselves at the end of history in a world only describable through neoliberalism's redeployed languages of modernity, through relentlessly totalizing pressure of market principles, and through a new set of brutally demonizing uh, rhetorics uh, of, about good and evil in the world. But the effectiveness of grand narratives, he says, can't be contested by skepticism and incredulity alone, least of all when new or refurbished grand narratives are so powerfully reordering the globe. Grand narratives can't be contested by pretending they don't exist. That's why we need new histories of society. In their respective times, both social history and the new cultural history were insurgent forms of knowledge, and the relevance of historical studies for the future will certainly require renewing an insurgent spirit again. So on the one side, a mood of defiance. On the other side, a, a, a notion of trying to capture the aggregate dynamics of social relationships as a whole. It's a call for a new kind of history of society, which is uh, an attempt to, uh, which stems from the premise that you can't contest grand narratives, perhaps, without coming up with one of your own. So it's not clear if we look at the existing historiography on contentious politics and contestation that we're capable at the present especially of rising to this challenge. If, um, I mean, if we look what are the grand interpretive narratives, the major interpretive frameworks for trying to understand contestation and contentious politics uh, in the region. And uh, ah, Windows could not activate. Um, so, ah, and arguably there are four ways to write of these aggregate dynamics. The first, uh, above all drawn from neo-Orientalism, uh, 
contentious politics in the region is somehow about Muslims and Arabs who fight the forces of civilization, modernity, progress, and globalization. They react against them. And that framework is especially applied in regard to uh, primary resistance, as it's often called, to colonialism, say in Algeria in the 19th century. And it's often applied as well in certain quarters to understandings of uh, recent Islamic resurgence. But of course, as we well know, it suffers egregiously from forms of cultural essentialism and exceptionalism. There's another grand narrative, uh, interpretive framework, uh, drawn above all from uh, many of the riches of historical sociology. But the idea is that protest and contentious politics, fundamentally, it doesn't stem from uh, a reaction to civilization, modernization, and globalization. It is fundamentally emerges from the developments associated with modernization, the development of contradictions within capitalism, and associated forms of demographic, social, and economic change, the rise of new social classes. It arises from the form of globalization itself. And these explanations are especially thought to apply to the rise of nationalism, liberalism, Arab socialism, Nasserism, and so on, uh, that were especially important between the 1870s and the 1960s. But this grand explanatory framework suffers from materialism, teleology, determinism, Eurocentrism, and the like. There's a third possibility drawn ultimately from a strongly articulated use of the concept of discourse. And in this, contentious politics and social movements are basically the ciphers of discursive power. Those who engage in them are the mere puppets of prior epistemological, juridical, colonial, economic, and discursive practices. And as such, those rounds of contention are not particularly interesting. They can't tell us that much about real power. They don't have that much meaning in that context. I mean, consider the, the, the wonderfully accomplished study of Jordanian nationalism by Joseph Massad. Jordanian national identity is an effect, a colonial effect of prior colonial epistemological and juridical discourse. Uh, but arguably it was precisely Edward Said's uh, failure, quote unquote, to not fall for this line of discursive determinism in toto that made his work so interesting and the tensions within it so productive. I also think there's a contradiction sometimes within discourse theory because what discourse theorists set out to do is they set out in a revolutionary way to uncover the discourses that, uh, within which we think and within which practice is enacted. But then in writing a history which makes all contestation appear uh, merely to be a cipher of those discourses, it nullifies the very revolutionary premise from which it begins. The third possibility, which comes from uh, the fourth, sorry, possibility in, as a grand interpretive framework for thinking about contentious politics is drawn from a variety of influences, but the influence of the linguistic turn being um, important. And this is uh, a, a body of work also sophisticated, important, significant, which treats uh, instances of resistance and contention as it, it teases out their ambiguities, it teases out the fluidity, the contestations, the forms of hybridity, uh, and the, the shifting way in which gender, uh, ethnicity, nation, multiple identities, and so on, forms of complexity, pragmatism, parody, uh, Lisa Wadeen's ambiguities of domination, and so on. Uh, 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 Julia Clancy Smith's work on, uh, on, on notables and popular protests in Algeria in, in the mid uh, 19th century, uh, it, it, this interpretive framework teases out ambiguities in such a way as that we end up at a point where it's very difficult to say anything meaningful about that resistance in the large, or at least that would be the, co the, the, the criticism. The criticism would, would be that we end up in a position of a kind of a shapeless multiplicity, and we certainly can't connect these instances of resistance to anything so grand and abstract as the aggregate dynamics of society as a whole. They can't give us the basis for rising to Jeff Ely's challenge, uh, whereby we have to think of a history of society. Perhaps under this sign, it's very difficult to have a politics 
worth the name at all. So uh, the project I have in mind here is to look at contentious politics in the region uh, in its transnational optics in a way that differs from the above possibilities. And it's rooted in a concept of the dynamics of hegemonic contestation. And so here, hegemony is conceived as the complex unity of material domination on the one hand and projects of moral, intellectual, and political leadership on the other. It's a way that there's a Gramsciologist called uh, Michel Filippini, and he, 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 this is the way he defines hegemony. And it, it, and it refers to the, le to the level of the social formation as a whole. And the question always is how it is that ideas and political forms of imagination are stitched into and bust out of institutional arrangements. How the complex unity of domination and moral political and, 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 and uh, intellectual leadership is achieved, especially at the level of the state and of ruling groups. The question of how consent is won, uh, for, uh, among key constituencies, how the acquiescence of larger constituencies is achieved, uh, especially through forms of sacralization, identification, internalization of principle, and more material questions of stakes and spheres of autonomy and, and achievements. And I, I won't belabor all of this, but I will say that theories of hegemony do attempt to tackle the aggregate dynamics of the social formation as a whole, they refuse the idea of shapeless multiplicity. They are far, second of all, from falling into cultural essentialism and exceptionalism because hegemonies are highly syncretic and they are constructed and remade continuously. And reference on that point, uh, Antonio Gramsci's debate with Benedetto Croce on, on this very point of the authenticity of popular culture. Third, Theories of hegemonic contestation can avoid modernist teleology and materialism because hegemony rises and then it falls. It's much more, it's much less Max Weber in terms of a teleology of rationalization or modernization. It's much more Ibn Khaldun in the sense of the, the rise of, in his sense of, you know, the, the development of a kind of asabiyya and, and, and how that could then uh, achieve uh, the... Uh, the, the continuity of, of, a, of a kind of a, a dynastic form. But, and if hegemony can be understood as a matter of passing how the political imagination is stitched into institutional arrangements, it can avoid that meta-narrative of capitalism. In the sense, if we can accept that Khomeinism, Kemalism, or Nasserism could be conceived of as hegemonic forms, then the necessity to relate everything to the bourgeoisie or the proletariat is relaxed. And by the same token, I think, uh, because you can see I'm overexcited, that the, but the theories of hegemony can avoid the excesses of the linguistic turn and they can answer. See, this is what Zach Lockman says at the end of his book, Contending Visions of the Middle East. He says, what's necessary now? He claims that it's a very terribly modest conclusion, but he says, this is what he says. He says, over time, uh, uh, as the first flush of excitement over the possibilities opened up by the linguistic turn waned and as academic sensibilities shifted, there was a growing sense that it was possible, indeed intellectually necessary, to combine due attention to the question of representation with due attention to social and political dynamics, hierarchies of power and historical contexts, and to explore how these domains are intertwined. Not through classical-based superstructure Marxism, but by, quote, developing methods of analysis that took all meaningful human social activity, whether material or discursive, as determinative and indeed mutually constitutive. And if you read Raymond Williams on hegemony in that book, Marxism and Hegemony, written in 1977, his, the way he defines hegemony is in terms of the complex interlocking of political, economic, and social and cultural forces. So hegemony does promise a way of connecting some of these different domains. And finally, I think it can avoid discursive determinism because hegemony is always contested, actively articulated or disarticulated and uh, um, uh, fractured and so on. So in this context, I, would, I want to invite you to consider five waves of contestation in the region, in the Middle East and North Africa since the 18th century. 
I mean, everyone knows about the most recent one, at least anyone who's been reading the newspapers, the Arab uprisings. They don't yet have a name, by the way, uh, but we know that slogans of bread and dignity and freedom have been raised from one end of the Arab world to the other since December 2010. That wave broke with extraordinary power in an extremely arid and crisis-ridden geopolitical, domestic political, economic and social climate. And certain political models crossed borders very voraciously. Tactics like occupying squares, whether Tahrir Square in Yemen or Tahrir Square in, uh, in, in Masr, uh, slogans such as Shaab Yurid, Iskat al Nizam, which, of course, the idea of the people as, a, as, a, as, a, as the locus of political sovereignty, the idea that what they want is the fall of something called the regime, that model for reality crosses borders voraciously. The very form of protest itself. Uh, was promiscuous in crossing borders, such as the a pitched battle, the idea of having a pitched battle with the police. The first border it crosses, arguably, is from Suez to, uh, to Cairo, uh, when the, the, the idea that you can defeat the police in pitched battles, which starts to happen on the 26th and 27th of January in Suez in Egypt. That idea arrives in Tahrir Square and... and, and uh, and, and, it, and, it, and it's electrifying in terms of this collapse of the, the idea of the wall of fear. Even, of course, the idea of self-immolation uh, and, and, and others. These are mod uh, political models for reality that cross borders with tremendous speed. And of course, not uniformly. They're appropriated by, they intersect with national contexts in highly varied ways. And in spite of the fact that those, uh, and, and they cross borders even though, especially the incumbents of different regimes insist that every country is different and that it won't possibly ha uh, we won't possibly have uh, an uprising in a Jordan or a Kuwait. But then by June 2011, there are protests that appear in Kuwait in ways that bear obvious, even in, a, in what's, it's true that the context is politically, economically, socially, radically different. But nonetheless, the idea is, you know, from it, the ruler's point of view, it's a little bit like Prince Metternich in 19th century Europe, where he said, when Paris sneezes, Europe catches a cold, meaning he's terrified of this contagion as he sees it, that the, this, uh, these political models will cross borders, they'll stir up protest. And of course, uh, for, from the other point of view, it's, uh, it's more interesting and, and exciting. But the second wave I wanted to point to is the remotest in time and by far the least commented on more generally as a wave of contestation in the Middle East and North Africa. It's the one that's most often dismissed uh, under the rubric of primary resistance or indeed as a mere a sort of a traditional convulsion or, or a form of backwardness and superstition. But it's interesting that particular scholars such as Ira Lapidus or John Vol or even PM Holt and Jacques Burke have tracked aspects of this more recently, someone like a Julia Clancy Smith. But you, you have a long, drawn out uh, 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 wave of contestation in which you have many incidents of protest that are joined under the banners of millenarianism, Mahdism, Islamic revival and renewal, heterodoxy, neo-Sufism and asceticism of various kinds, which crosses from one end of the region to the other, from the 18th all the way to the early 20th century. And, and, and Jacques Burke actually points this out. He, he, he writes somewhere in he, that book, Egypt, Imperialism and Revolution, he writes that just as coastal Islam, he says, was submitting to European conquest and economic encroachment, what he calls inland Islam or continental Islam was uh, rising up in a tremendous series of uprisings and protests. And this, uh, and, and, and of course it's tricky to figure out how this, where this begins, how it ends, but you have, it's very striking when you go into and you line up all of these instances of contestation. You have from the, uh, the Sharqawi order in Morocco, fighting against the centralization of Maulay Suleiman in the late 18th and early 19th century, 
the Tijaniya order in the Ottoman province of Algiers in the late 18th century, early 19th century. Of course, the al muwahidun in uh, Arabia uh, with this movement of Tawhid and the idea of Tajdeed within the faith. And even when you start looking, you find in the Janissary uprisings that were quite a familiar uh, feature of, the, of Istanbul and the Ottoman center in the 18th uh, and, and into down to 1826, the, the Janissaries themselves had strong links to um, the, the Bektashi Sufi order, and there were elements of uh, re revivalism and neo-Sufism that are associated with the mobilization of the townspeople there. And then you fight in Abdul Qadir in Algeria to the Awlad Sidi Sheikh, who uh, uh, and their uprisings uh, in the 1860s in Algeria and in the 1880s down to 1902. And of course, the, the famous uh, Al Mahdi in Sudan, who forms a state in 1883, it lasts till 1898. Uh, and the uh, Sanusi in Libya, uh, the jihad after 1911. And these, it's hard to miss how these movements are joined under the banners of jihad, of millenarianism, of Islamic renewal and revival, of the virtues of asceticism. As one of the right-hand men of al-Mahdi uh, uh, of, of Sudan says in, in, in his memoir, he says um, he, he, he captures an incident where the, the, the Khartoum has just fallen. And, and, the, and, the, and Muhammad Ahmed of Dongola, the Mahdi, who's supposed to be a deliverer, uh, is shown into a room that's full of gold uh, that's been captured from the townsfolk. And, uh, and he, uh, 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 and the chronicler writes, um, uh, the, the Mahdi saw the gold and he, and, and, and he immediately walked away with a dismissive gesture. And, uh, and he says, truly that were a turning away from the things of this world. But it's, it's just a, a, a tiny vignette on this ascetic theme that runs through uh, a lot of this uh, contestation, the critique of corruption, the critique of the rigidity of the orthodoxy among the urban ulama, the, the critique of local forms of tyranny, whether it's the days of Algiers or it's the Qaids that the French have installed, the protection of the Daris al-Islam against uh, rule over it by non-Muslims, these are all some of the repeated uh, themes that we see in that uh, grand wave of contention. And these are, I'm just trying to provoke by, by, by drawing these out. I can't go into them in any detail. But the third wave of contestation that we can speak of involves the, the languages and imaginaries of liberalism, patriotism, civilization, constitutionalism, education, reform, Islamic modernism and pan-Islam in many different combinations and possibilities, but it's discernible from the uprising of the blacksmith, Tanius Shaheen, in Lebanon, what was to become Lebanon in 1858 to 1860, who declared a republic through the uprising of Colonel Ahmed Orabi in uh, uh, Egypt, 1881 to two, under the banners of constitutionalism and liberalism, the activism of El Afghani, and into the constitutional revolutions in the Ottoman Empire and Iran, the Arab Revolt, 1916 to 1918, the Iraqi Uprising of 1920, then in Syria, 25 to <coughs> 7, the, the Waftist Revolution in Egypt, 1919, the liberal experiment, to use Lutfi Sayed's terms, that followed down to the death throes of the Waft in the 1930s and 40s in Egypt. <coughs> Arguably, there's a fourth wave of contestation, which raises the banners of radical national liberation, pan-Arabism, Nasserism, Arab socialism, Baathism, communism, and third worldism, and so on. And it can be detected in some respects in the Palestine uprising of 1936 to 9, but then it runs like a golden thread through the coup d'etat and the armed struggles and the forms of political mobilization of the 1950s and 60s down to the student movements of the 1970s in Egypt or the uprising in Lebanon that, uh, between 1975 and 1976 that then leads to the Syrian intervention and, and, uh, uh, and, and the failure of that alliance of, of leftists and pan-Arabists and Palestinians and others to unseat the conservative sectarian elites that Elizabeth Picard calls them and as Fawaz Trabulsi 
told us last week at LSE, um, this was, the, as it were, the opening round which of, 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 of something that then uh, led into a, a series of civil wars. But you have, so, so that's another uh, wave of contestation. A fifth wave of contestation, of course, much remarked, raised the banners of a new religious politics through the conversion of Islamization of intellectuals from Said Qutb to Ghanoushi, from Musa Sada's movement of the dispossessed in Lebanon through the Iranian revolution, the jihad in Afghanistan, to the FIS and the GIA in Algeria and Hamas in Palestine, Hezbollah in Lebanon. And it's been a major and much remarked feature of the politics and mobilization of the region from the 1970s to the present. So if it's true that there's something in these five waves of contestation and that there are some ways in which the alignments that one can see are not purely random. Uh, what I want to do, the, the, the point of this paper is to draw attention to the fertility of the border crossing political imagination, the way models are appropriated across borders and the way they come to have an impact on contentious politics and indeed on the construction of alternative hegemony and hegemony in given contexts and the way they're rooted in crises of existing forms of hegemony. And there's plenty of scholarship that's already been done that uh, gives us a sense of how this might operate. The idea that those contending in a political field in a given context, especially at periods when you find a crisis of authority, are voracious appropriators of political models that are, available, that are available and inspiring in the transnational space. And Lale Khalili, who I think was here a couple of weeks ago, had showed this in great detail in her book, uh, Heroes and Martyrs of Palestine, in regard to the Palestinian National Liberation Movement, in especially the part that's rooted in Lebanon in the 1970s, uh, uh, and the ways in which tropes of third worldism and the idea of the new man, the idea of armed struggle, the idea of a struggle against neo-colonialism uh, are appropriated within, uh, I mean, one example, on the pages of El Hadaf, Hassan Kanafani's uh, magazine that he's editing in the early 1970s. There's nothing about Palestinian everyday life in the camps. It's about the Vietnamese peasantries. It's about vignettes from, uh, from, from Che Guevara and so on. It's a, 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 a good example of how that transnational space in which you have different alternative uh, political models that are inspiring are appropriated and then deployed in forms of mobilization and activism, especially to do with the Thawra. But Zach Lockman has, if, uh, skipping back to the early 1900s in uh, Egypt, uh, has, has written this article, Imagining the Working Class. And what he means is he's shown how this notion of uh, the idea of the working class as an identity, the idea that workers, that the word amil, uh, it doesn't just mean agent, somebody who does something on the instructions of another. It comes to mean a worker in the sense of somebody who has the identity, social belonging, a certain politics, a certain relationship to capitalism, the state. And, and he, he tracks the way that idea is partly appropriated by uh, middle class nationalists in Egypt looking for a constituency to represent in their struggle against the British and then how that category of identity shapes the way uh, workers activism uh, develops on the ground itself. I've written a, an article trying to show how the, if we look at the political protests, the, the labor protests, and, uh, 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 and some other kinds of popular protest on the Arabian Peninsula in the 1950s and 60s, how they're linked to migration circuits uh, uh, and, the, and, the, and the ideas uh, to do with Ba'athism, especially the movement of Arab nationalists, the Harakat al qawmiyin al-Arab in the 50s and 60s, how these uh, 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 these, the ideas and political models, the notions of pan-Arabism start to inform uh, labor protests in the docks of Aden, for example, in the 50s and 60s and beyond. Julia Clancy Smith has given us a sense of the permeability of the borders between Algeria and Tunisia in the uprisings there in the 19th century. And let's note further, if we look at Edmund Burke's book on pre-colonial protest in Morocco, we find that 
you know, it was a Maurita- the son of a Mauritanian warrior, El Heba, who ruled Mar- Marrakesh briefly in 1911 to 12. Uh, 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 under the banners of a radical, egalitarian, ascetic, and heterodox version of Islam. And, uh, and that links into um, to this whole wave of movements on the southern Sahel of the Sahara that go back to the 17th century that are also Mahdist, uh, and they have a lot of these uh, similar features, heterodox kinds of features. They, and there's been some work by John Vol. He's tracked some of the continent-spanning reach of the scholarly networks associated with Salafi revivalism at the end of the 18th century, those ones that are rooted uh, in in Mecca and the scholarly circles. And indeed, you read the Ira Lapidus, History of Islamic Societies, there's a section on the spread of uh, the Sufi orders, especially in the 18th and 19th, 18th centuries, which is a globe-spanning. It's not just the Middle East and North Africa. It includes Central Asia, Southeast Asia, and beyond. And we can note also with Rudolf Peters that Abdul Qadr himself, Abdul Qadr al-Jazairi, who's fighting the French between 1830 and 1847 in Algeria, he's quick to shore up his nascent mini-state in Algeria with legal judgments from ulama as from as far afield as Fez and Cairo. We note the work of Ilham Khuri Makdizi. She's connected the Eastern Mediterranean to larger patterns of radicalism in the late 19th century. Edmund Burke has written on the activities of pan-Islamic activists in Morocco in the early 1900s. Charles Kurzman has situated the Iranian constitutional revolution of 1905 to 6 in a larger transcontinental picture that reaches from Mexico and the constitutional movement there in uh, 1911, and to China, to, uh, where, with the unseating of the Qing dynasty there. And Michael Provence's project that he's working on now is linking the uprisings of the Mushrik of the interwar period, he's linking them all together. The, 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 it, so with, it, the, in Syria, 1920, the, insurre- the July insurrection against the Faisal government with the arrival of the French, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the revolt of 1925 to 7 in Syria, the Iraqi uprising of 1920, and of course the armed struggle in eastern Anatolia, and the, uh, the, um, and the Palestine uprising of 1936 to 9. And if we read a, a Francois Bergat, or a Madawiya Rashid, or a Laurence Louet on contemporary Islamic movements, we can hardly only be struck by the transnational connections that exist. And recall the, the point from uh, John Calvert's recent biography of Said Qutb, where he, he, he notes that Said Qutb, on his execution in Nasser's prison in 1966, was uh, a, a complete unknown. He, he, he wrote his uh, Quran commentaries, and he smuggled them out of jail on bits of paper, but no one had read them. Uh, But by the 2000s, and it's at that time, of course, we remember that Richard Mitchell, who'd written the book, The Society of the Muslim Brothers, and he wrote in the late 60s that this kerfuffle over the execution of Said Qutb, it's completely meaningless, it's just a band of uh, people who espouse a so-called, a Muslim position on society, puts it in quotes, and it's not relevant to our present. But then you fast forward to, through 40 years, and you find in uh, John Calvert's biograph- bi- biography of Said Qutb that his work is influenced uh, Islamist movements from the Philippines to Morocco, with many people in between citing this man, his work, the, the, especially this political category, the category which allows you, as a Muslim, to, uh, to uh, come into a situation of opposition with a, uh, a, 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 a Muslim ruler because of uh, this idea of jahiliyyah. But, um, and of course his work has been translated into dozens of languages, Malay, Turkish, uh, uh, and on and on. And of course there's this famous reference in the social sciences, which is Benedict Anderson's work, and he has emphasized in that book, Imagined Communities, from the early 1980s, how nationalism, once it became modular, it became available for appropriation and diffusion in a wide variety of political, economic, and social contexts. And, but here's where uh, I think things for me get a bit more interesting and, and then uh, and, and a way of emphasizing how can we get to a richer analytic of appropriation. Because if we look in the Anderson, you find there are basically three possibilities 
for how ideas get appropriated across borders. The first one is the prior development of uh, print capitalism and how that in some kind of sociological way prepares the ground for a style of imagining that can conceive of the community in terms of deep horizontal bonds of kinship. The second way it happens in Anderson, and this is he sort of shifts his thinking because then he studies Southeast Asia a bit more and he says, well, uh, it's now got to do with the colonial state. The census, the map, and the museum are the ways in which it becomes possible for uh, communities and, and, and colonial subjects to appropriate this model. That's the second possibility. But I, I wanna, I'm, I'm not especially in favor of those first two possibilities because I think they're determinist and don't, they don't capture the, the central significance of the political field, which is what I'm interested in. But there's a third possibility, which is it comes in the uh, uh, afterword of the third edition of Imagined Communities, where, Benedict, where he, what Benedict Anderson does is he tracks how his book has been appropriated and translated across borders. And uh, what he says is that effectively the book was taken up in different contexts by different people who were pursuing different political agenda. Uh, I mean, there's even a Palestinian version, he says, with Aziz al-Azmer writing the preface, and you can see how it makes sense in that context as, as, as a version of, uh, in terms of contestation. But, he, but at the end, he says, you know, this is, this is not my book anymore. This is no longer my book. And he says it's been subject to piracy in the positive sense. He says, there's no patent on my book. And in a way, we can make the analogy and say, yes, there's no patent on nationalism, and it can be pirated across borders in the positive sense in different political fields. And if we take the third, the third version of Anderson's appropriation, the one that comes in that uh, uh, afterward, if we take that seriously, we can perhaps relax some of the sociological and statist determinism of the first two frameworks, because it could be that we, people appropriate ideas in political fields even though the political, economic, social, and cultural context is radically different and heterogeneous. And that's the part that I'm interested in. And I want to spend a little moment expanding on what that could involve. I mean, you might say, well, why is it interesting to relax the socioeconomic determinism? I mean, if you read uh, Fred Halliday's book, Arabia Without Sultans, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderfully accomplished book, but it suffers from social and economic determinism in that the idea is that socialism will appear in the Arabian Peninsula insofar as you have the development of working classes in the peninsula. And I remember, just to exaggerate a little, I once ran into Paul Dresch, uh, who also wrote on Yemen. He's an anthropologist, and he said, uh, it wasn't something he published, but he just said, yeah, Halliday says there's a working class in, uh, in Yemen in the 1960s, but in fact, there was only one biscuit factory, and, uh, and you know, so it's all complete nonsense. But, um, but, uh, but the thing is, I'm not agreeing with Dresch in the sense that uh, there's still this appropriation of that idea, which is clearly at stake in the activism in South Yemen between 1963 and 1967. It's a very powerful idea. And uh, so, so it's, but, so, but, but we might agree that Halliday's version, uh, it could be problematic. Actually, the, uh, Robert Vitalis's great book, America's Kingdom, which is another very accomplished book, it completely excludes the possibility that the workers of, uh, in Aramco in Saudi Arabia um, who are protesting between 1953 and 1955 that their imagination could possibly have been shaped by Ba'athism or Nasserism or Pan-Arabism. He excludes it. He says they're Saudis and they, are, um, they protest because they're men working hard, you know. And so, um, but I think that's too, um, that's, uh, I mean, it's important and there are reasons why he has it that way. But it's, uh, I think it, it, it's not sufficiently cognizant of the possibility that models for reality are appropriated across borders. And uh, so, but so to unpack on this idea of how is it that appropriation can happen in a political field, 
Well, there is this concept, if it's not social and economic determination that allows for appropriation or the prior existence of, say, the census, the map and the museum, I mean, if it requires a census and a map and a museum, how is it that the Palestinians acquired a national identity? They didn't live, un, uh, you know, they were, so anyway, that's an, perhaps an aside, we can go into that. But if we, if we just point to this, the question of the crisis of authority, you can argue very schematically that it was amid the crises at this, uh, vis a vis the, the, the wave of contestation I referred to as revivalism and heterodox Islam. It was amid the crises of Ottoman rule, local tyranny, doctrinal rigidity, and remoteness of European invasion, and amid critiques of superstition and deviation that millenarian, heterodox, revivalist, and Sufi and neo Sufi ideas cross borders with such fecundity in the 18th and 19th century. Running forward, it was the crises attendant on state centralization, debt crisis, European economic encroachment and direct colonial rule that paved the way for the appropriation of liberalism and nationalism and Islamic modernism from the 1870s to the 1920s. It was the crises that attended the liberal and patriotic leaderships in the 1930s and 40s and 50s, their brand of notable politics that paved the way for the rise of new and radical forms of economic and social nationalism in those years which then got written into the institutional arrangements, especially in the revolutionary states and propagated towards the Arabian Peninsula and the Moroccan and Jordanian monarchies and Lebanon alike. And then it's the crises that attend these revolutionary states in the 60s and 70s that helped pave the way for new forms of political Islam after the 1970s, especially propagated by the Islamic Revolution in Iran and the Jihad in Afghanistan, but also appropriated in highly diverse settings. And arguably, in some respects, it was a crisis of domination without hegemony, or at least somewhere like Egypt, that formed the context for the spread of protests associated with the Arab uprisings. But so what is this, though, this idea of the crisis of uh, authority? And um, uh, here's Gramsci on the crisis of authority. He says, in every country, the process is different, although the content is the same. And the content is the crisis of the ruling class's hegemony which occurs either because the ruling class has failed in some major political undertaking for which it has requested or forcibly extracted the consent of broad masses, or because huge masses have passed suddenly from a state of political passivity to a certain activity and put forward demands which taken together, albeit not organically formulated, add up to a revolution. The crisis of authority is spoken of. This is precisely the crisis of hegemony or general crisis of the state. We see how there's always this double vector. On the one side, a crisis uh, in the hegemony of the ruling class or the ruling groups surrounding the state. And on the other side, the activities of huge masses who pass from a state of political passivity to a certain activity. And there are certainly striking parallels with this, with how Konstantin Zureik understood the crisis, uh, understood the term he coined, the Nakba, in 1949 the catastrophic dispossession of the Palestinians at the hands of Zionism. He, he said, I mean, the, 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 the very influential uh, tract that he wrote in late 1949 said that the Nakba wasn't just a failure of this or that individual. It wasn't just uh, even, you know, the blundering or incompetence of a given regime. He said it was a profound catastrophe, a crisis in the Arab, of the Arab order in general. And uh, we can see how this, uh, this notion is then mobilizing in certain sectors, particularly uh, among uh, free officers, whether in Egypt or Iraq or elsewhere. There's this striking passage in the biography of uh, a Palestinian guerrilla fighter uh, from the, uh, where he's writing about 1967, uh, another crisis. He says, when we learnt of what Hassanein Heichel called the Naxa, of course, propagandistically, because it was much worse than a Naxa, it was in fact a, a crisis. When we heard of, of the setback, the, the Naxa, we, he said, we were all students in Beirut, and we immediately, everybody suddenly started proposing solutions. You know, what, what are we going to do? Because we're now in, 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 in a crisis. And, uh, and you have this notion of, of how people get shocked into action and they, and, and, and they engage in a search for uh, re-articulation, which is uh, the, the search for some alternative. 
which is attendant on these sudden moments of hegemonic disarticulation. So the basic idea being that at moments of revolutionary crisis or in the search for radical alternatives, movements can pirate, ransack, and appropriate ideas and tactics from the transnational political field in the service of political contests at home. And in fact, even though Karl Marx is often associated with determinism. Look at this passage from the 18th Brumaire. He says it's precisely in moments of revolutionary crisis that people start to conjure with ideas. So here he is, men make their own history. It's very famous. It's one of the most famous political pamphlets ever written. Uh, but they do not make it as they please. They do not make it under self-selected circumstances, but under circumstances existing already, given and transmitted from the past. So the tradition of all generations weighs like a nightmare on the brains of the living. And just as they seem to be occupied with revolutionizing themselves and things, creating something that did not exist before, precisely in such epochs of revolutionary crisis, they anxiously conjure up the spirits of the past to their service. They borrow from them names, battle slogans, and costumes in order to present this new scene in world history in time on a disguise and borrowed language. And he's referring, of course, to Napoleon III, but also to the language. What the language he's referring to is the language of Rome. It's the language of... Uh, of uh, uh, the Roman imagery that attended the, the French Revolution. And there's, there's, a stud, there's studies of that. There's a book actually from the 70s um, which goes into what it, why were French revolutionaries so occupied with Rome? And, 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 and the explanation is not uh, sociologically determinist at all. It's the idea that it made them large enough for the moment, something like that. That, the, that to drape yourself and to borrow and to use the costumes and battles, slogans and time-honored uh, rhetoric of the Roman and being Rome. And, and, uh, and I, I wanted to make a parallel because uh, Abdul Qadir al-Jazeri was also writing a pamphlet in a French prison in 1849. He was also in exile. He was also fighting the French. And he, in that pamphlet, is also conjuring and, and debating with how it was that uh, Napoleon III was claiming the mantle of Rome as part of his colonization of Algeria. And he was saying that we will uplift those benighted Romans who in fact exist somewhere in Algeria and we will civilize them, etc. And Abdul Qadir is, he tackles that and he says in his pamphlet, the, not, the question is not whether we, we this is... He doesn't actually say this, but this is what he implies. The question is not whether we Algerians are worthy of Rome. He says the question of whether, is whether you, Napoleon III, are worthy of the mantle of Rome. But, uh, but, but, but the point then being actually that Abdul Qadir himself in his activism, he conjures with the spirits of the past. He borrows from the names and battles. He, 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 get, he does a bayah. He, he gets his oath of loyalty in 1832 under a tree in exact uh, replica of the way, uh, in his mind, of the way the prophet had done it, uh, uh, you know, 1,400 years before. So, so there's this idea of piracy, which it involves abandoning socioeconomic determinism, um, tackling the question of how the political field is constructed, and then thinking of that in terms of that there are questions to do with the crises of authority, there are questions to do with re-articulation, the production of alternatives and alternative forms of hegemony. And then there's the question of uh, hegemony itself, i.e. the construction of the linkage between those projects of political, moral, and intellectual leadership and forms of power uh, uh, written into the state. And you can see how these appropriations across borders, they're not just ephemera. They're not simply costumes or epiphenomena of deeper social and economic processes, they drive forward the very nature of the crisis, the form of the crisis of authority itself. We see that in <coughs> Konstantin Zurek's uh, notion of what was the crisis that happened in the Nakba. He's defining it, and, and, and so there's a, there's a definitional element. But you can see, for example, if we read Hannah Batatu on the communists in Iraq in the 1950s, you can see how they're, because they have this model, this political model for reality, which uh, says that in Iraq at some point eventually, although probably not yet, we have to have a communist revolution. Uh, not yet, because they, they find themselves at loggerheads with people like um, um, 
Abdus Salam Arif, who's going around saying that we have to have equality and we have to have, we have to get rid of the notables and the sheikhs and the communists who are much more linked with the, 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 um, the, 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 the Kurds and the Iraqi nationalists and not the Pan-Arabs, they say, no, no, Iraq's not ready for that yet. So, but nonetheless, they have a model for uh, reality and it leads them to make all these swinging criticisms of the, the, Jordan, of the uh, Iraqi client monarchy and how it's a stooge of the imperialism and, and, and so on. And this, so this in a way helps define what the crisis is and, and how significant and, 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 and what it means and implies. Or if you, there's that communist pamphlet that hit the streets of Khobar in the early 1950s that Vitalis looks at in his book, uh, America's Kingdom, which speaks about how the rule of the Cadillacs and the rule of the American pigs and the reactionary sheikhs is soon to come to an end. So of course, those who have an alternative model for reality are then the very ones who are the most, who are the most, um, who, who can often be the ones who produce the most swinging criticism of the existing order, which in turn deepens the crisis, it deepens forms of disarticulation as well as defining roots out. But in terms of rearticulation itself and the construction of alternative hegemony, models for reality are a key element. They're a key element in building up a movement, in, capable, in, 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 in creating the possibility of offering an alternative and thus attracting supporters and sustaining mobilization. When the question, what is to be done, uh, is, is put, uh, then those who have uh, a, a model for reality are able to reply. Uh, if if uh, in, in, uh, in, in Nasser's Egypt or in Akram Hourani's uh, Syria, with, when the constitution is in tatters or the constitution is not being applied, what is necessary? Social justice. Or when the monarchy is compromised, the idea that we need a republic. Or when the republic is destroyed, we need an Islamic state. Or when in Egypt, the paramilitarized police had humiliated the mass of the urban poor on a mass scale and amid indifference and corruption on high, the cry of bread, dignity and freedom goes up. And so the, the argument here is that the appropriation of political models across borders is able to make a contribution to the vital work of rearticulation, to joining up social, economic and political elements and groups and individuals in new ways, as well as providing principles modes of identification and even sacralization that are capable of winning their consent and promising in the future achievements, spheres of autonomy and material stakes and rewards for collaborators. In some ways, ideas can act like uh, Weber has, Max Weber has this passage in the sociology of religion where he says that ideas can act, um, and of course it's another one of these very gendered, you know, it's always men, but they act as the railway, they act like railway switch men. Meaning at certain moments, especially of, well, it's what Mark Bisinger calls in his book Flux and Uncertainty, an idea can act like a, a switch man, and, and meaning that it changes the track. It, he says it then determines the tracks along which action is pushed by the dynamic of interest. So that's what Weber writes. So the idea that you can, if you have a model for reality, it can determine the tracks on which action is pushed by the dynamic of interest. It's not an idealist formulation, but it, it, it simply gives credence to that notion of uh, how the political imagination could be involved. And just because I can't, I, I, I can't resist this quotation, even though we could argue that it's an exaggeration, but if we're thinking of hegemony itself, uh, the politics of articulation, as you might put it, how it is that, because ideas that prove to be salient in contentious politics can often be adopted by rulers, even when they lock up and repress all of the proponents of those ideas. And this is what uh, John Maynard Keynes had to say, the mathematician and economist, of the, especially of the 1920s and 1930s. He said, the ideas of economists and political philosophers, both when they are right and when they are wrong, are more powerful than is commonly understood. Indeed, the world is ruled by little else. Practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influence are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. 
This is very true today, of course. Madmen in authority who hear voices in the air are distilling their frenzy from some academic scribbler of a few years back. I am sure that the power of our vested interest is vastly exaggerated compared with the gradual encroachment of ideas. So this is Keynes. You know, perhaps it's an exaggeration, but it's nicely put. But it does, if we think of madmen in authority, well, you know, I don't perhaps mean madmen, I, I, but if we think of people in authority, um, uh, I mean, we, we, we note how this, this, this can happen too. I mean, if you remember how uh, Hosni Mubarak and Omar Suleiman in Egypt were busy torturing members of the Muslim Brotherhood and cooperating in US secret rendition programs while at the same, in the same breath persecuting gay men as if to outbid those very Islamists on their moralizing agenda. Or if we think of how uh, President of Iraq, Saddam Hussein, in the 90s started to drape himself somewhat in the banners of Islam amid the fearsome repression of popular Shia movements that started to become more significant in the 70s. And we note Gamal Abdel Nasser's turn to socialism even while socialists languished in prison. So the argument there being that the rounds of contention to which I referred, these waves of contestation, they had their results, some intended, some unintended, but they got in, and, and they're stitched into institutional arrangements and political settlements in different ways across the region. All the way from the Mahdist state in uh, Sudan between 1883 and 1898 and or Nasserism uh, and perhaps the Mohammed uh, Morsi, the president of Egypt right now, in some respects, uh, at least, there's some sense in which the ideas associated with the activism of the Muslim Brotherhood are now appearing at the level of institutional level of the state in Egypt. So the idea is that the pirating and appropriation of political models across borders in contentious politics seems to have a constitutive role in the making of contestation and its outcomes. It's not just an epiphenomena of other more fundamental forms of social economic transformation or factors associated with state formation or imperialism. So that's, uh, just to conclude then, many have spoken of the spread of protest across borders during the Arab uprisings, but I submit that the problematic of how border crossing and transnationalism actually plays a productive role uh, has not been subject to as much attention as it deserves in regard to the contestation in the Middle East and North Africa. So the idea behind this talk was to interrogate that question. And against the, the conventional wisdom, but building on the work of a number of scholars, I've tried to explore the hitherto rather occluded significance of the border crossing political imagination in the making of contentious politics in the region. But I tried not to lapse into culturalism or to deny the importance of local context. And the idea is to consider the rise and fall of given forms of hegemony, which are rooted in the state and their crises, and the rise of alternative hegemonies, and to study the role in which the appropriation and the piracy of political models for reality across borders matters amid hegemonic contestation. And I drew attention uh, to those five great waves of contestation and linked them to these features. Early modern religious revivalism, patriotism, liberalism and reformism, national liberation and socialism, political Islam, and to some extent, bred dignity and freedom. And I think this is a way of getting away from neo-orientalism, discursive determinism, shapeless multiplicity, and socioeconomic determinism alike. I wanted to show that political models for reality have been appropriated across borders by those contesting the political field in ways which have shaped the incidence, form, and content of protest, and a fact that in turn impacts the political contest and the outcome itself. So the idea being that the transnational space and forms of appropriation that articulate with it, this has some kind of analytic value and empirical significance. It's not just a mere epiphenomena of other processes. And the idea is in part to respond to Jeff Ely's challenge that in order to have a politics in the contemporary world, we have to try to think beyond uh, 
uh, either forms of microhistory, shapeless multiplicity and ambiguity, and towards histories of society and the aggregate dynamics of social formation as a whole. But to finish just with this one thought, the question becomes, if the political imagination is so significant, why is it that the alternative proposed in the Arab uprisings, bread, dignity, freedom, leaderlessness, horizontalism, and so on, has so speedily been hegemonized by pre-existing forces and forms of activism in the political field? But looking at this paper, uh, the argument would be that the answer to that is not as pessimistic as you might think, because processes of rearticulation in these long waves of contestation that I've mentioned, and, when, and the rise of new ideas capable of becoming to universality in the social formation as a whole, it's a long, typically a long drawn out process, even though it can be very, it have sudden changes and sudden movements, it's still a long drawn out process, and that's been the case in the history reviewed here. So in other words, if new ideas are coming and are to come from the broadly secular and left tradition, and I think they are, they, they are there and they are coming, we can't expect them to conquer or dissolve the existing alternatives that we've seen uh, that have been presented by political Islam overnight. Thank you for listening. Um, um, I don't mind. Okay. Uh, uh, how long do we have for questions? All day. <laughs> okay. I like it. <laughs> that, okay. We have half an hour for questions. Well, thank you, John. You, I was wondering, um, you know, it's a very uh, sort of vivid and evocative, uh, um, you know, talk about imaginings. How would you locate the issue of counter-revolution um, in, particularly around the sort of the current Arab uprisings in this framework that you've uh, talked about, the transnational flows? Yeah, well, that's a very good and difficult question. Uh, because I'm not, I'm, I, it has a very slippery uh, place in this, uh, in this theory. I, I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's under theorized here. Uh, and, because um, I was especially thinking about this in the case of um, the constitutional revolution in uh, the Ottoman Empire in 1908. Because what you have is, in many ways, it's the third army that's based in Salonika that has an idea about constitutionalism, and it, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it sort of, I mean, there's a brief armed struggle, but then it enters Istanbul, and Abdul Hamid II, the Sultan, just says, okay, uh, uh, let's have a constitution, and he champions it. But meanwhile, he's working behind the scenes to foment, for foment the counter-revolution. And, uh, but the thing is, uh, it's, it's, yes, yeah, so it's tricky, because the, first of all, the constitutional revolution, it's not really, it's very difficult to characterize it as a mass movement. It's quite unlike what happens in Iran, where you have a real mass movement. Uh, in, in, and, then, and then the people that get involved in the so-called counter-revolution, artisans, townspeople, uh, crafts and service workers, low-ranking low on the map, uh, you know, they're quite, it's quite a popular movement. So, uh, I, 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 I can't answer your question properly. I, 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 to me, it's, it's uh, counter-revolution has this very strong sense that, uh, um, I mean, one of the interesting features of, of the, of the um, actually, I can't even make that generalization. I, I, I think that you have to, uh, I, I think that I'd have to see counter-revolutionary mobilization in this framework in terms of the way, in terms of a process of uh, re-articulation. That would do. Mm. Yeah. Well, that would be provocative and provocative. Um, two questions for you to sort of flesh things out a little bit more. One would be to talk about the um, actual modes of the border crossing. You don't talk about media. 
or maybe bodies. You could take it any way you want to go. Love to hear you talk about that more, um, since um, method um, is is important. And then in your conclusion, yes, hopeful. How do you uh, avoid, though, a sort of charge of just being progressivist? Uh, well, on the second one, progressivism is as pro progressivism does, <laughs> in the sense that, you know, can it create a viable movement? Can it win consent? Can it uh, develop core models of subjectivity, selfhood, and community that are compelling? Can it create a possibility of an alternative hegemony? Can it win over the acquiescence and consent of larger you know, subaltern or other constituencies? Can it create a, a situation where people will feel that they have material stakes, spheres of autonomy? Can it create this? That's, that's the question that, that, that I would, that in, in terms of, because progressivism can't be anchored in some pre-existing meta-narrative of modernization or the development of capitalism. So it has to, it can, it can only establish itself as, uh, as a, a movement can establish itself. So that, if you will, is my anti-foundationalist answer to that question. On the question of the modes of border crossing, it's interesting because I definitely, it's a vital question, but I, I, I do de-emphasize the, the role that the, the media Play. And when I say media, I mean everything from the rumor mills that operated in the Sufi brotherhoods, uh, orders, sorry, in the 19th century that Julia Clancy Smith tells us about, through to oh. the modes of print in print capitalism, in you know, Ziad Fahmi's work on, on media capitalism in Egypt, or, or indeed on the role of, of the different, you know, the busting apart of the state monopoly of the media in the Arab world since the 1990s and the arrival of satellite media, social media, and mobile phones. It's so often, again and again, for me in this framework, it comes out that the media, it transmits information. It transmits those models for reality, but it doesn't, first of all, uh, you know, Abdul Qadir, when he wrote to the ulama of Fez and Cairo, he only, it's only one letter and he only got one letter in response. So it's not a deluge of information. It's not an internet where, where you can find, you know, uh, a, a billion hits for whether or not it's legitimate for him to seize the chattels and goods of Muslims who don't defend him in his jihad against the fr infidel French. But you do, that one letter is enough, as it were, in this context. So it has a huge impact that's disproportionate. Well, you know Zygmunt Bauman's thesis about how the media that because now you have so much information, the question is of selection, and it diminishes the impact of the information because there's so much of it. So I don't think we can draw determinist conclusions even from just the sheer fact of the density of the media or the way, it's, it's, it's so often a question of what is being appropriated. And you see how, I mean, you see how the, the, the mobilization that occurred over the cartoons, the offensive cartoons that were published in um, you know, uh, Johnny Hebdo in France, of, uh, and the Danish cartoons the, of the Prophet Muhammad, etc. The, the mobilization occurred through the media, but the models for reality that were being transmitted were of one kind and one sort, and they, weren't, they, don't, they don't have a, a, determinist, a determinative relationship to the form of transmission, I suppose. So I think, I mean, here's an example, you know, Wa'el Ghonim, the, uh, in his biography that he managed to produce in five and a half minutes after the uprisings, he, he, he says he did not cover the protests in Tunisia on his Kulina Khalid Saeed website. He didn't cover them until the 13th of January 2011. So he's the administrator of a website that's being followed by hundreds of thousands of people, social media, vitally important. And, uh, but he doesn't cover them. Why? Because he's, he says, if I cover them and they're repressed, it will be depressing for everybody. So it's, he's got a good point. He doesn't cover them because he's worried that people will be depressed. So it's, but those kinds of decisions are crucial, but they're highly dependent on an interpretive appropriation of what's happening in the political field. They're not dependent on the brute existence of social media. It's curious, he decides to cover them you know why? On the 13th of January, 
because Zinedine ben Ali apologizes on the 13th. It's not when he falls from office, it's because he apologizes, and that's very impressive to Wa'il Ghanim. Meaning that he is, that's partly how the political categories in his head are functioning, that he's impressed by the fact that this leader has apologized. And as we know, others, and you could cite, for example, revolutionary socialists in Egypt, they weren't impressed that Ben Ali had apologized. They might have been slightly impressed when he fell from power, but they weren't. But so the, the media, the flow of information, how it's received, who brokers it, uh, uh, obviously vitally important. John, thanks for that extremely exciting talk. Um, I have a question for you about the term political imagination. Right. This is, I think, part of your title, and you refer to it a lot, but what do you actually mean by it? What's the theoretical purchase of it? You talk a lot about ideologies, Nasserism, nationalism. You talk about new ideas mm. and how they travel. Yeah. But certainly you're not an idealist. I, I don't suppose you think that ideas determine all political dynamics. No. So could you elaborate a little bit yeah. on that notion? Yeah. Well, what, okay, so what I mean is the, the political imagination is uh, it's, about, it's, a, it's a model for reality, and it refers to politics, which I would define as attempts to solve, think about the dilemmas of collective life. But it, the way it matters is it bears on these processes of articulation, disarticulation, and rearticulation. So it, it bears on, it, 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 especially, especially sacralization, like this possibility of making something sacred out of existing institutions, whether in a secular or religious mode, on identification, on this, um, this, uh, the way in which you identify as a collectivity with a given uh, institution. I mean, this came out very vividly, say, in, in Egypt in 2011, when many people who were on the streets said, we are Egyptians, we're patriotic Egyptians, and that's why we're here to oppose the blood-sucking, uh, uh, corrupt uh, regime. So our identification as Egyptians, some, suddenly it, it's articulated in a way that puts them against a given uh, uh, institutional form. Whereas at other points, say, following 1973 in Egypt, that notion of being Egyptian was very much uh, a way of identifying with uh, the, the sort of the hero of the crossing, Sadat, and the Egyptian army, and so on. So, so sacralization, identification, and the other one is just principle, the internalization of principle. And, but I also think the political imagination plays a role in the more earthy, questions of whether people's material stakes in the order, um, the question of whether one can think of a sphere of autonomy that one might have. I mean, this is my work on Syrian workers. The mode of articulation wasn't, to, it wasn't imaginative. It was that they can uh, achieve a project that matters to them within the context of working temporarily in Lebanon and returning to Syria. Uh, but, and their project is to do with breadwinning, it's to do with pressure, it's to do with male social honor, it's to do with uh, bringing up children, it's to do with having, having a household. And this, so that, but, but still, the, there's, there's still the political imagination is relevant because it's this idea that I don't, I'm not involved in politics. I, I don't do politics, don't talk to me about politics. This isn't political. And, and, uh, and so there's, that, but, and so, but there's always the possibility, as there was in Lebanon in 1976, when Syrian workers started to protest and they started to adopt languages associated with the then uh, forms of Arab socialism, they were, they, there was a, a way in which it, it came to bear. So, so that's something about what I mean by the political imagination. It serves certain functions in processes of hegemonic articulation and rearticulation. Except for yours. Thank you so much. <laughs>